What I'd like to talk to you about is a false narrative that our employer locally, UK-wide, are feeding us. And this false narrative has impacts for all four of the bits that are part of this dispute. Um, so first, I get a lot of questions about how negotiating actually works for pay. It works very differently than it does for our pension scheme. So um, UCU is part of a collective bargaining a group of trade unions, five of them, who collectively bargain with UCIA, our national employer. Um, and three of these unions are currently balloting over pay. So UCU, Unison, and Unite all have live ballots on these four issues. Now, when Jinches, the collective body, was formed, um, what was negotiated was a UK-wide pay scale for staff. And at the time that this was started, there were 51 points on the spine of this pay scale. And the idea was that having a national pay scale would, would do great things to help solve things like gender inequality in pay. It would ensure that there was parity across the sector. So in many ways, this is a very desirable thing. Now, as inflation has occurred, um, two of the spines on this pay scale, or two of the points, have now dropped off because they're below the voluntary living wage, so they no longer exist. So we're, we're, the pay scale is getting truncated. OK. Um, now, um, here is the employer's pay offer for this year. And you might have heard some of these numbers before. So for all of us who are members in UCU, the pay offer is an increase, and I very much mean those scare quotes, of 1.8%. Now, We'll come back to talking about inflation at several other points throughout this talk, but where that is below inflation rates, what we actually are getting is a pay decrease this year. So a wonderful pay award of a decrease in our pay. Um, now, at the very lowest offers, this is a quote from the pay offer, um, at the very lowest points on the scale, the employer has offered more money. And this is the last good thing that I'm going to say about this pay offer this year. Um, so for those at the very lowest points on the spine, um, they're receiving a pay, it's actually an increase, of up to 3.65%. Now, why is it that people at the lowest end are receiving a larger pay increase? Because the staff side unions absolutely demanded it. And I want to read you a quote from this. So the, the employer's rationale, very generous of them, is this will mean that the hourly rate for the lowest point on a 35-hour week will exceed the prevailing voluntary living wage. Oh, that is very generous. I'm so touched that they have increased the pay just enough that people can actually be above the voluntary living wage. Barely but they're there. And it took this enormous increase to get them to that point, the lowest points on the scale. Okay. Now, um, and one more thing before we move back to the employer's offer. Um, that bit is the UK-wide bit, but how does this fall out at individual universities? So locally, UCU and the other unions will bargain with the employer um, to divide those four, now 49 points into different bands or grades, which probably everyone's very familiar with. Um, these don't necessarily match from university to university. So for example, if we look at what is the bottom of grade seven here at Sheffield, that is point 0.28 on, on the, the scale. Whereas if we look across at Leeds, they're 28, which is the same amount of money, but that would be something that somebody near the top of grade six would be earning. Okay? So already for what it's worth, we at Sheffield, for some of these grades, are at a slight disadvantage to other comparable Russell Group universities. And this is something that we're going to be addressing with the employer over the coming months. There are other points on the scale, though, where there's a lot more parity across the sector. So for example, point 37 um, at both Sheffield and Leeds and at many other comparable institutions, um, 37 is the bottom of grade eight. So this would be roughly where a lecture might start. Okay? And that's going to be very important. We're going to come back to point 37 in a couple of slides. 
Now, now that we've got this background out of the way, I want to talk to you about four myths that the employer tells us about our pay and working conditions. Myth one has to do with yearly increments. Yearly increments are not a part of your pay rise. So if you were, for example, hired at Sheffield at grade 8.1, so you're a starting lecturer, you start at 8.1. The following year, you would move up to 8.2. Repeatedly, at both local and national level, the employer tries to tell us that moving up that point is part of the pay package for the year, but it's not. So as agreed, back when Ginches was formed, these yearly pay increments represent the increased experience that an employee has the longer they do their job. When you start as a lecturer and you start teaching, every year further that you teach and that you conduct research and that you work with colleagues is a year that you have gained experience doing that job. And it is in our pay bargaining agreement with our employer that that will be recognized by a small increase in pay. What's another reason that we know that this isn't actually a pay rise? Because you can hit a ceiling. So let's go back and look at grade seven. When you hit 7.9 at the University of Sheffield, if you're not promoted, you stop. You stop right there. You no longer get that yearly increase. The idea is that you have now gained enough experience in your job that you were at the ceiling of performing that job. Okay? There are a couple of other points above it. Those are exceptional. You have to apply for those. You don't always get them. We know for a fact that in, there is a gender and race bias in the people who are able to be awarded those. Now, I don't know how many people in this room are professional services colleagues, but hitting the ceiling of the grade you're in is an absolutely enormous problem for people who are in professional services because of the sector-wide lack of a clear promotions pathway for that entire group of our membership. So it is completely false and completely damaging for the employer to claim that these yearly increments are part of our pay package, one, because they are not, they reflect experience, and two, because many of our members aren't even receiving them anymore. Okay. Two, the employer likes to claim that things really aren't that different than they were three, five, ten years ago, that these below in, um, inflation pay increases that we've been receiving haven't really had a big impact on our pay. And for those people who are at the higher ranks, perhaps people who are already professors, perhaps it doesn't feel to you as if there has been that big of an impact on your pay. And I can understand that. But they do add up, and they add up in a very specific way that leads to generational pay inequality. So what I have here, um, I have starting lecture pay um, at Sheffield. So again, this would be <coughs> the bottom of grade 8.37. Um, and if you look in 2013, a lecturer starting that academic year would be making um, 37,756 pounds. Okay? Now, somebody who started three years later in 2016, okay, they're making a little bit more money. The starting pay has gone up. And we look again to this year, so, so any of our colleagues who are starting this year, they're making a little bit more money as well. When we adjust, for inflation, however, and I've used um, RPI in these calculations. I'd be happy to talk in the question period about why I've chosen to use your RPI, how it differs from some of the other inflation metrics, and perhaps why our employer chooses to use a different measure of inflation and why that's a problem. Um, but for now, um, when we now adjust these three starting incomes for RPI, we see that an individual starting lecturer's purchasing power has gone down by over 2,000 pounds. So just in the space of 2013 to 2019, every single year, a new starter is at a decrease of that amount of money. Now, I want to show you how this adds up over time. 
So what I've done here is I have looked at four hypothetical starting lectures at the University of Sheffield. So this would be someone starting in 2010, somebody starting in 2013, 2016, and then this year. And um, I've followed their journey, which includes those yearly pay increments, through up until now, up until 2019. And I've also RPI adjusted each of those salaries to be in 2019 dollars. So it's adjusted as of the RPI rate for August 2019. What we see when we look at this, just looking at, for example, the person starting in 2010 versus 2013, ah, uh, okay, it doesn't seem like it's that bad because by the fifth year that the person who started in 2019, by their fifth year, they're making roughly the same amount that the 2010 starter was making in their third year. There's been a definite decline in pay, but it's still perhaps salvageable. Now though, we look down at the person starting in 2016-17. By this year, this person hasn't even caught up, not even close, to the starting wage of the person who started in 2010. Now, let's look at our poor colleagues who are starting this year, who may not, within their career, realistically be able to reach the starting salary of somebody who started just a decade before them. These pay decreases add up, and they hurt our youngest and most vulnerable employees the most. Now, add on top of this, what if this employee is a bit older than the person who started in 2010. Why would they be older? Perhaps because they've been in a casualized contract for anywhere between two years and a decade. So a full grade band or two below. How does all of this add up over time to impact what they're gonna take home from their, their pension? And that's even setting aside the independent attacks that are occurring on our pension scheme. But even if our pension stayed exactly the same as it was, the impact that this will not only have on this individual's ability to buy a house, to start a family, to leave academia if all of the other working conditions get to be too much, and their ability to live comfortably and safely in retirement are all compromised just in a decade. And we have absolutely no reason to believe that the trend of a de yearly decrease in pay is going to change. Okay. Now let's add on top of this workload. Okay. The, the lecturer who's starting this year has that many more administrative tasks to do than the person who started in 2010. They have that many more students to teach or that many more contact hours. We divide this across sort of create our own hourly wage for our job and the amount, that, the amount of decrease is even greater. Okay. Now let's add on top of this, if you're a BME member of staff or not a man, okay? Um, and now we can add on top of this that your promotion opportunities are comparatively limited. The vast majority of people in our sector who are carers are not white men. The vast majority of people in our sector who take time off to bear a child are not white men. You add that disparity on top of this and how that will impact the promotion opportunities for these people and the problem gets even worse. Um, I also wanna draw your attention to, so at the end of this graph, you'll see I've got 43 four times in a row. That's because I wanted to show you the impact that um, hitting the ceiling has on your pay package. So this is assuming that this is somebody who, who, for whatever reason, hasn't been able to successfully make an application to become a senior lecturer. They haven't moved up a grade band, so they're stuck in grade eight. Just starting from um, the four years that they've had, their pay has decreased markedly in real terms each year from that. And as I said, there are a lot of our colleagues who are stuck in this position due to unequal promotion opportunities. Um, related to casualization, um, it's not just, as we all know, it's not just a hypothetical that people hired now are more likely to be on casualized contracts. If we compare from 94-95 
to 2017-18, the proportion of staff who are on casualized, the proportion of academic staff who are on casualized contracts has gone sharply up to the point where at some universities in this sector, it's as many as 50% of academic staff who are on casualized contracts, non-permanent contracts at any point in time. As Sam alluded to earlier, um, we also know that expenditure on staff is falling in real terms. So universities might tell us, oh, we're spending just as much money on staff as they were before. Um, this is patently false. Okay? So if you look at the proportion of both expenditure and proportion of overall university income, both across the sector, um, so this is data from HESA, so this is sector-wide data, and even at individual institutions you can see a sharp decline in the proportion of income or expenditure that's spent on staff. So Sam did an analysis like this for Sheffield last year. We quickly, um, last week, we were at Goldsmiths and then at Cardiff, and we looked at the financial data for those institutions and found a similar drop in the amount of money that's being spent on staff. So this is something that's happening across the sector consistently. And finally, in the lovely austerity regime in which we find ourselves, the employer likes to claim that they simply can't afford to increase our pay. This is false. Looking across higher education, since 1993, there has been only one single year in which the sector has been in deficit. Every single other year, the sector has been in surplus. Now, when you look at individual institutions, you find a much more complex pattern. There are some higher education institutions that are in deficit right now. We're lucky at Sheffield to not be one of those. We're in a very nice financial position. Um, our university could afford to increase our pay. Other universities that are currently in deficit like to claim that they could not. Look at our books. They say, if we were to increase staff pay, what would have to go? Well, I'll tell you what would have to go, because the reason those universities are in deficit when you start to dig into their financial situation is because of poor investments on things that are not staff or students. Things like capital expenditure, shiny new buildings, um, things like overseas campuses, investments like this. If even those universities that are in deficit, if they were to change their financial priorities to go back to the core business of a university, which is staff and students, they would not be in the situation that they're claiming to be in. So I want to end by kind of saying something similar to what Sam said. Why do we need to ballot over this now? Why do we need to ballot over this dispute at the same time that we're balloting over pensions. Workers have, have made absolutely no gains without the involvement of trade unions, historically. And almost every single one of those gains has come with the threat of industrial action. Our employer will only listen when we threaten industrial action. I can tell you as a pay negotiator that the employer is reluctant to even talk to us about things related to workload casualization and gender and ethnicity pay gaps. You'll notice that I haven't spent a lot of time in this presentation telling you what they've offered us. I, I won't dignify what they've offered us with that time. What they've offered is to gather information on whether or not workload is a problem. They have offered to gather information on how being not a white man impacts your salary. They've offered to gather information on rates of casualization. We don't need to gather information. The UCU Anti-CAS Committee has been gathering information for over a decade and has taken that information and has actually suggested actions that this sector could take to address casualization. The employer themselves, who appear to this year in 2019, you've just discovered what the word intersectionality means, has already gathered data showing that a gender pay gap exists and that an ethnicity pay gap exists. Now is not the time to gather more data. Now is the time for concrete solutions. We've seen 
tons of data on the impact of workload. And I'd really strongly recommend anyone who hasn't had the chance to look at the work that Liz Morish is doing on this subject. There's a HEPI report that beautifully outlines the crisis that stress and workload is creating in this sector, both in terms of physical and mental health. We know these are problems. We need actions. And our employer won't even talk to negotiators without the threat of industrial action on the table. What we need is to force them to come to the table to address these four issues. And the best time to do that is united with Unite and Unison, uniting post-92 and pre-92 institutions, and basically saying, all of these things are tied together. We reject the narrative that USS is feeding us. We reject the employer's willingness to go along with that narrative. We reject the austerity narrative being fed to us by our government. And we reject our employer's parroting of that narrative. So it's incredibly important to vote yes, yes on the pay inequalities ballot, it is just as important, if you can, to add those two extra yeses for the USS ballot. And that's what I've got.